Welcome to Political Paradigm. I am Terry Ikumi. My guest is Professor Pat Utomi, a former presidential aspirant and governorship aspirant as well. He's also a political economist. Professor Utomi, welcome to Political Paradigm. Thank you very much. Please join you. You've lived through the years. You've virtually done it all. You've attempted to uh, run for office as well. You've been observing the policy in a while. So let me start by asking you this. When you look back at the evolution of Nigerian politics, how well would you say that we've, we've evolved? What changes have you seen? Yeah, there have been changes. Sadly, some are remarkable changes, some for good. Uh, unfortunately, a lot in reverse throttle, really. You know, I, I like to think of myself as a, a child of independence. I was born before Nigeria's independence, just a few years before that. I started school in Kano in the year of Nigeria's independence in 1960. I was born in Kaduna, family had lived in Jos, Medugri before Kano, and then most of my primary education was in, in Guzo. So in a manner of speaking, I saw through the crisis of the 60s uh, with very educated young eyes, young but very educated ones. Uh, and part of it is because um, when I was... Uh, an altar boy in Guzo in the early 60s. Uh, school was run by American Catholic priests of the Dominican order. And John F. Kennedy, who was the first Catholic president of the United States, uh, was in office. And so for my sins, if you will call it that, I got books, all kinds of things about Kennedy, Camelot, and all of that. So at age seven, eight, I had the exposure of a 30-year-old in terms of public life and what it meant and, and stuff like that. So, the 60s, clearly years of enormous competition between politicians. The goal of their competition was who would most bring good to their people. Now, we're in regions back in those days. The, Independence Constitution was based on several regions of a country. Uh, went from four, from three to four. And um, if you look at how development started in Nigeria, it was so much competition about who would get ahead first. And in many ways, the Western region blazed the trail in a number of things. Of course, colonial Nigeria did not industrialize Nigeria at all. Uh, it was just for raw materials to go to the metropole. And so one of the first things that happened to Nigerian politicians was the wanted industrialization. By the time self-government came, 56, 57, uh, and the new leaders of Nigeria were Nigerians, they began to compete on who would most industrialize their place. Uh, if you want some deep understanding of this, you go and read Pius Okibo and Nigerian public accounts. And you see how the regional marketing boards built up significant reserves. Uh, relatively speaking, in the accounts in the UK. Between 1957 and 1960, these accounts were drawn to almost zero. When I ask people today, what do you think happened to the accounts? They say, ah, they chopped the money. <laughs> I said, no, they didn't chop no money, literally speaking. I mean, they basically drew down those reserves to create industrial estates. First of that being the Keja Industrial Estate, Western Region, which the East tried to respond to by doing twice as much as the West, Transamadi in Port and Aba. In fact, some manufacturers like Pfizer moved from Ikeja to Aba. That was the nature of the competition. The Sedauna got the Kakuri Industrial Estate going. And very clear strategy. Look at our endowments. Curtain was a big endowment in the north, cotton was being grown around the place. Kaduna became the hub of the textile industry, which became the biggest employer of labor in our country outside of government by the time we got into the 70s and 80s. By independence in 1960, manufacturing, uh, manufacturers had moved to nearly 10% of GDP in Nigeria in that short space of time. So this competition, uh, again, if I try to speak to some of the people who have studied it, it was referred to as competitive communalism by two Americans, uh, Wolpe and Melson, Robert Melson and Howard Wolpe, 
I studied this and wrote about it. The essence of politics in Nigeria was who would most bring progress to the people. Unfortunately, the nature of that competition was so intense that it created some excesses. The failure of the process with the excesses, which more time would have helped manage, unfortunately, military fellows didn't wait. By 66, they had intervened. And in their intervention, a new thrust of politics was created in Nigeria. Uh, this new thrust, unfortunately, because a civil war immediately started, was built on this idea of national unity and centralizing everything so that things would be right around the country, whatever. That process, compounded by the discovery of oil in 1956, 57, in Oloibiri, in today's Bayelsa state, led to plenty of money being available <clears throat> to those in power. If you watch in the politics of the 60s and 50s, subnationals created wealth. Governing was really bottom-up. And most of the industrialization, whether it was competition about who would first get a radio station, TV station, blah, 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 all of this came from the region. I mean, classic examples is we're broadcasting. I, I like to give this, I enjoy it. You know, Western Nigeria jumps ahead. First television station in all of Africa in 59 in Ibado. Ibado had TV before Brussels before uh, Dublin and Eastern region, boom. So Ibadan, because I lived in Ibadan in the 60s, I went to Loyola College in Ibadan. Uh, if you woke up in the morning, WNTV first in Africa. And Eastern region replied, second to none. So that was their own way of line. So anyway, all of that was replaced by military that had so much cash centralized all the authority, and then the nature of Nigerian politics then became the big man, the general at the center, handing some prebends to the small vicars called governors in the regions. And a friend of mine, an American uh, academic called Richard Joseph, actually called that bureaucratic prebendalism. You know, like a visa, handing out prebends to... And the governors began to stop thinking, you know, they just waited to collect and share. Uh, now, Nigerian politics then went from who would outproduce the other to who would get the biggest share than the other. And if you check throughout human history, what has made countries rich is production, not revenues that are shared. So all of Nigeria's politics, literally speaking, since the 80s have been about sharing, and they have only made Nigeria poorer. It has got much, much worse in 1999. In terms of the politic in itself, um, if we begin to look at the return to democracy in 1999, you know, some would say that at that point, it seemed like a new democracy was formed and we're trying to grow on what uh, we had built. You know, when we talk about the return to democracy, Many say, you know, we're still evolving. Do you think that from 1999 till now that we have actually evolved in terms of how the politicking is conducted? There's always going to be some evolving. But sometimes you can evolve in a way that makes things worse. And I tell you why our evolution since 1999 has been much, much worse. Um, first, in 1999, when the military decided, okay, we've had it, we're going. I mean, people like us were the ones. It was civil society that got rid of the military, not politicians. Once the politicians were knocked out of the way, they just retreated into their backyards, laid over. When civil society fought the military and got the military to go into retreat, civil society was in a quandary. There was a dilemma. What should we do? And as one of the leaders of the concerned professionals, that was one of the main forces of the time. I hosted the meeting on what should we do. The debate was between those who said, let's go into politics, seize the space, and build the country of the image of all the things we've been writing. And those who said, look, we're businessmen, let's go back to our businesses, and let's let the politicians, who used to do well, except for their excesses in the 60s, come back and do it. But we made a fundamental miscalculation. We thought those politicians were ready to come back. 
Unfortunately, those politicians thought the soldiers are not serious. They're going to come back next week. So they stayed back. And friends of soldiers moved into the space. As politicians. As politicians. When they moved into the space in 99, oil prices, which had come down to single digits, $9 in the last Abacha days, suddenly began to shift up and reach three four digits, $120, $30 a barrel. And because our institutions were weak, because accountability was so low, these guys pocketed the Commonwealth and used money as a barrier to entry into public life. And Nigeria was sunk and will be going down since then. Because politics, everything has now become about money, sharing, kill, you're important only when you have a title. It wasn't that way. In the 60s, and Onyeka is probably going, is going to knock my head over this, but she may like it, but I keep using her example. Her father was the school principal in Port Harcourt at Newtonia High School. He was a member of the federal house. He rode his bicycle around and borrowed money from her mother. That's the parliamentarians we knew, not the characters you guys have in Abuja today that say they're in the National Assembly. Those ones are social parasites. The ones that were there in the 60s were people who went to serve. They were simple men, smart men, and women, but they came to serve. Now, people who have nothing else to do come, sell their houses, steal ballot boxes, come to Abuja. Can you even begin to think, since the economy began to go south, people on the streets of Nigeria dying. Every, every text message is a, please send me. Have you seen our politicians shed load? Have their motor kids become smaller? Have they bought less fancy cars? Have you seen governors in commercial flights? Every time they come to Abuja six times a week, they chatter an aircraft, but they can't pay salaries. This is a fundamental difference from a politics of service and sacrifice of politicians living simple lives to what we have today. It is not sustainable. In my view, if we don't clear out the deck, if all these people don't get out of the way, our country will survive it. I can assure you, because a mindset has developed. We have experienced a collapse of culture. And when there is a collapse of culture, what you get is what somebody has described as the arrogance of failure, swag in the middle of an accomplishment. Uh, Prof, we'll come to that aspect of clearing them out the way, as you rightly put it, with the coalition that you're working on. But listening to you, I think it's safe to say that Nigerian politics now is about money and greed and the fight to be there. And it raises the question, why did Nigerian politics suddenly become dirty? It hasn't always been dirty. It is dirty now, isn't it? So why did it, and at what point did it suddenly become and, and that's, dirty? And that's part of the explanation of what happened in 1999. I was talking about those early days. I'll give a simple example. H.O. Davis, Chief H.O. Davis, uh, who saw is a very good friend of mine, and Dr. Namdi Azikiwe, uh, were political rivals. They wake up in the morning, who are campaigning for different parties and all that. In the evening, Zeke will drive up to H.O. Davis' house and pick him up to go and play tennis. They will drink beer, drop him back at home. The following day, they go and campaign on the other side. It was not life and death. It was nobody blackmailed the other. These were men of character. Now, what happened in 1999? I'm sorry to use this language, but because the original politicians did not step into the space. The kinds of people who were available were generally bagmen of the soldiers. The bagmen of those soldiers essentially did not um, quite understand politics as service. Did not, they just understood the concept of big man. So the big man is to be served and not to serve. So in being served, they created a culture in which you had to take from the public treasury to reinforce the statesman. So whoever you like, 
you handed out a prebend to, you know, you had a big man, people came to you to get and to service that. And I'll be frank with you, a, a certain politician who, who has worked in your industry, I should mention the person's name, who became a senator, said to me one day, we were, we were flying, said, you know, there's money in this politics, so, but you don't end up with anything. <laughs> because you end up spending it, sustaining the myth of the big man. Sustaining, you know, oh yeah, you see, your constituency will come to you, and say, pay my daughter's school fees. That's not what politics is about. It's about making sure that everybody's daughter can go to school. What about you paying that person's daughter's school fees? So the whole misconception of politics just kept deepening the desperation to get money out of politics. That's why Prof, really let's look at how we conduct our elections now. It would seem that the Electoral Act since 2010 you know, has not actually improved our electoral process. I don't know if you will agree with that because I recall in 1993 that election, which was adjudged the best, the fairest election we've ever conducted, was not conducted with the Electoral Act. There was no Electoral Act at the time when that election was conducted. So what exactly uh, has gone wrong here? Why is it that our electoral laws have not really improved the process? You know, laws, uh, if you want to go into the volumes that have been written about laws through human history, you would just get sunk. But um, uh, the French laissez-faire writer, uh, Frederick Bastiat, is the one who I love his uh, expression of what law is. You know, uh, human beings are always in the pursuit of gain without pain. And those of them who capture power enact laws to advance their interests and so it, and it is created to give the impression that it's in the interest of everybody but the truth of the matter is that these laws are designed to advance their interests and so these people uh, uh, make a point that institutions and institution building really is about how we create boundaries to human conduct we have been poor in building institutions in Nigeria. How do you build institutions? Because our, our tendency is to assume that if you enact a law, you have created an institutional arrangement. Nonsense. The best thinker that I know of on the subject of institutions and economic performance is a fellow called uh, Douglas North. He, he has passed. I had the privilege of uh, spending time with him on a sabbatical leave in 1996 when he was at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. One of the greatest lights into understanding institutions. And Dougie North will tell you that institutions evolve. They evolve from self-interested parties who invariably find out that it's best to advance the common good than to try to take advantage of your personal position today. Because tomorrow is your opponent that might be in a, an advantageous position and you will be suffering. So eventually everybody will agree, let's have a level playing field. This is how institutions evolve from the role of civil society. That's why I was a great fan of Chief Ghani Fahemi, because he litigated everything. From litigation, you will get a series of judgments that then begin to define boundaries, that then show, you know, what is acceptable behavior. This is what ensures that right is done. Um, so that we've enacted all kinds of laws since 1990. The spirit is not what was responsible for, for the great, uh, the, the, the law is not what is, was responsible for the great 1993 elections, but the spirit and the character, you know, um, as the motto of a secondary school, you know, where government secondary school, they say when wealth is lost, nothing is lost. When health is lost, something is lost. When character is lost, all is lost. And the problem has been a problem of character, even from those who go into electoral management. I was fascinated by 93, because everybody who now swears by that election, most of them said, ah, this was so, this was so, this, this, this. And I kept laughing. And I kept saying to them, he will shock you. Why did I keep saying he will shock you? I was a student. I was in the first class, he thought, in the University of Nigeria in 1993, when he returned from his PhD. And I got to know the man. He, he raised such excitement in us as students that I knew the mind of Musu, the character of Musu, 
would give us something. I didn't know how, and he did. That's the problem that we have till today. People who do not say history will forever judge my conduct. This is about immortality. Well, Prof, uh, then again, we have always tried to push for electoral reforms. We have seen attempts at those reforms. But the question is, why are there no visible reforms? Have you seen, or how well would you say that we've gone in trying to push for these reforms? Unless you have a major constituency, civil society, that is committed to these changes and is ready to sing for, lose life on account of it, you don't get those changes. Look, Machiavelli told us 500 years ago that nothing is more difficult to bring about than a new order of things. Because those who profit from the old order will do everything to prevent a new order from coming about. And the second part I like more. Those who could profit from the new order do not do enough to make it happen. Because man is incredulous in his nature, not wanting to try new things until he has witnessed the experience of it. So, because civil society kind of went to sleep in 1999, we thought, oh, we fought so hard, we liberated our people from these soldiers. Everybody relaxed and went back. Turned out that the reformed soldiers were much worse than the soldiers in uniform, by far much worse. And Nigeria has sunk so far further since then. Now civil society is waking back up. Uh, I mean, an organization like Serap, every time I hear Serap, I just, my, my, my soul rises because you, you realize civil society is waking up again in Nigeria. What, what, what role does the politician have to play in terms of improving the process? Very important. And this is because we have the wrong kinds of people in politics because it's actually the politician or even the judiciary. I, I had the privilege at uh, the um, uh, um, one of the bar association events in Lagos you know, just a couple of uh, days ago to speak to judicial activism and the nature of democracy that we are building. And I, I cited an example, not directly from politics, but applicable. Some of the best writings on why entrepreneurship is better, easier, more effective in the United States than anywhere else in the world, turn to the judges of a U.S. Supreme Court justice called Louis Brandeis. And and I said, look, judges can change the course of our history by the kinds of judgments that Louis Brandeis gave created an atmosphere where a young person with nothing but his brain can come up with an idea and take it all the way and creatively destroy the leading capitalists of the time. And, and, and uh, Raghuram Rajan and Luigi Zengales in their book, Saving Capitalism for the Capitalists, you know, explore this territory uh, significantly. What has happened, unfortunately, is that we have created a judicial culture in which somehow the judiciary thinks that its role to maintain the peace means being, well, poodle of the executive branch. And they've lost the opportunity to build a great democratic order in our country. Um, well, we... Um, we can see a rebirth, hopefully, in the judiciary. But politicians themselves, the reason that we don't have the politicians who are leading the way is that we don't have issues politics in Nigeria. You join this kind of party, but we have machine politics, not politics really. A machine politics is a machine that enables you win election, fair or foul, and get position. But if you have politics based on issues, then the big issue would throw up a politician who might be a one cause politician. My reason for being as a politician is electoral process reform. He will run for elections based on a desire to reform the electoral process and lead legislation that will make the electoral process a better one. But what we have doesn't give room. We deal with big men and not big issues. That's part of what we are struggling with now. We must reinstate politics 
big issues, not big men. One of the concerns with our elections is voter turnout. And I did some digging and found out that in 1999, when we had just returned to democracy, out of about 57 million registered voters, at least 30 million turned out to vote for the presidential election. Now, fast forward to the 2019 presidential election, out of 82 million registered, just about 28 million showed up to vote. That is where you add all the rigging and all the panning. Well, and, you know, I'm, well, just, I'm just telling you <laughs> that in reality, probably 70 million people voted that what year. What is the problem? Because Nigerians are voting against our democracy. They're voting by not voting. Okay? What do I mean by this? There's a series of studies that started in 99, um, or in 98 really, the Afrobarometer series. And this measures the attitude across Africa of the citizens towards democracy. The excitement that the Nigerian, you know, felt in 98 about democracy was so high. By the time they saw the democracy flounder to 2003, we had bad elections in 2003, 2007 we had the worst election in our history, um, began to say, this is, elections are coups by other means. Let's just leave them do, God will deal with them. That unfortunate attitude of God will deal with them meant that they voted with their feet away from the pulling boots. And so, and, and, and by the way, the kind of politicians we have now like that, the fewer people that vote, the better for them. That's why they've weaponized poverty and they use violence to ensure that most honest, decent people will not even want to risk coming out on election day. And that, that's good for them. So the few that come out, they can buy them. Um, but it's not sustainable because democracy works from legitimacy, which is conferred on the elected. When that legitimacy is lost, as it seems to have been significantly lost today in Nigeria, you begin to have the kinds of Boko Haram, the, because people have no other way to, to respond to a system that cannot be changed to work better for this, than to get violent. So those who think that is profiting them are short-sighted because that profit they have will be totally destroyed by a violent culture that the failure of the democratic process enables to emerge. And so we need to educate them in their own interest. We need to return to big issues. I keep talking about the place of um, debates in elections. And I don't mean presidential alone. I mean local government election, councillor. Let them stay in the marketplace and debate what you're going to do for the local government. Let them operationalize it and say, this is what I'll do in two weeks, in one month. If I don't do it, this is how I should be held accountable. When you have rational public conversation of that nature, democracy will lift you. But when what you have is, you know, what the Igbos call tibuzobu, <laughs> you know, you capture power. You can operate there and people look at you with contempt, as they do Nigerian politics. Most Nigerians think of politicians in contempt, but the politicians don't care because they don't have a sense of shame. So they carry on the way that they are carrying on. If we're going to rescue Nigeria, we must prevent that attitude. We must have politicians that feel the pain of the people. Look, okay, you get to some excess in modern politics in the West, where politicians are looking every day at the polls and determining their position by where the polls are. But in the manner of speaking, that's the way politics should be. Think of the feeling of the people. But here, there's a complete disregard for how people feel, think, or live by the political class. So the whole business of politics now in Nigeria must be about taking our country back from these people who call themselves politicians. All right, let's come to the recently signed electoral act now. The president is seeking an amendment. Uh, to the newly signed Electoral Act, which he, Section 84, Subsection 12, according to him, constitutes a disenfranchisement of seven political office holders from voting or being voted for at conventions or congresses of any political party for the purpose of nomination of candidates for any election in cases where it holds earlier than 30 days to the national election. Do you think that the National Assembly should give this a thought? most important part of that whole amendment is moving us towards electronic transmission as a first step. Um, 
All the others matter, but matter marginally. They can begin, negotiate, or whatever, and come up with something. What matters is, can we get to more credible ways of determining the people's choice? Right now, I think the, the, the truth of the matter is that we need to be moving towards our being able to vote with our cell phone from wherever we are. If we can get a BVN for everybody, if Nigerians can transfer one million naira every day from their accounts to another person's account, and the person can't just cast a simple vote from that same telephone, you are a liar. You are just trying to prevent that Nigerian from exercising his right to vote. Because if he can stay and vote with that telephone from his room, you can tell every story you want to tell. It's not dangerous for him to transfer one million from his account. But it's dangerous to vote for somebody he doesn't care about. It's just a lie. It's just because you don't want the Nigerians to exercise their vote. Because most of them fear the violence of election day, so they don't vote. And you want that violence because you don't want them to vote. So they are pursuing peripherals. Whereas the real truth of the matter is, how does the Nigerian manage to exercise his right to determine who governs without being subject to election violence, standing in the sun, your, oh, your, your, your voting poll has been moved to that place, your number is there, all deliberated by political class. I, I, think, I think this argument will continue. The reason I say that is that while some say that this position that you take could clearly increase, um, improve voter turnouts and uh, probably the process. There are, there's the argument that the areas without coverage are larger okay. within the country. I mean, I've spoken with politicians who insist that back in their areas, there's no coverage for electronic voting. So will that not, would that not lead to disenfranchisement? They know now they care so much that... Uh, the coverage in the area is the problem. Huh. Your politician cares that much? No. That's balderdash. It's an excuse for not wanting the right thing done. Let's be very frank. All of them are calling their grandmothers in their village. And they say that coverage. You know, as the people say on the streets of Nigeria, that's not the lie of the devil. <laughs> Prof, let's talk about <laughs> women participation in politics. It's uh, it's quite sad. I think uh, it's quite sad that the turn of events at the National Assembly now. I think my concern now is personal concern, and I think to an extent many people would wonder how this will affect uh, the level of participation of women at the polls. Not those who would be on the ballot now. Where, you know, women turn up a lot to vote. But do you see this provision? or the lack of the provisions, you know, having an effect on women participation at uh, the polls. If we were wise people, it should. You know why it should? If I were a woman, I would dedicate everything I have to making sure that every woman in this country comes out to vote and make sure that anybody who voted against that bill never enters political arena in his life. That should be a target that anybody who voted against that thing, women should make sure they never enter political office for the rest of their lives. That should bring out all the women to vote rather than make them not vote. And it is the duty of elements in society to conscientize them and raise this consciousness that will lead to this kind of choice being made. You know, I think it was disgraceful. I mean, I travel around Africa, and in the smallest, most remote parts of this continent, they're doing better than Nigeria. And the reason is very simple. We've got the wrong people in politics in Nigeria. And they're thinking not about Nigeria. Oh, we may know. They're thinking, ah, we allow this one. We might not get to the next seat. It's all personal. It's all selfish. And they use culture as the excuse. It's nonsense. Absolutely. Nonsense. Let's, how about independent candidacy? Let's say it makes it into the constitution amendments in the, eventually. 
What change will that bring to Nigerian politics? Well, um, at least it will allow um, taking a position by a popular person who the so-called um, internal or lack of internal democracy in parties may have prevented from getting uh, um, a, 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 a slot. It may also uh, be useful for a person who just has a single issue that motivates them, which the parties have not shown any interest in, so the party, and so the person runs on that simple, sing, sing, single issue on uh, um, an independent ticket. But if we are to take the history of independent candidacy, uh, especially for the biggest positions in the land, we find that very often it is very difficult. Uh, we are political machines have already created the semblance of a two-party system uh, for independent candidates. Uh, I lived in the U.S. when a uh, uh, congressman called John Anderson did a remarkable job of running as an independent candidate, and then was followed by uh, was a Republican guy with a big ear uh, uh, many years ago. Uh, they had resources, personal resources, ran a very strong race, but in the end, the system had a way of making their effort. So, yeah, I think it's a good idea to have it, but I don't think it's a cure-all. I think what we do need to do is build political parties. I mean, we don't have them today in Nigeria. These are just uh, election machines. Uh, and what is a political party? First and foremost, they believe in some socio-economic way of organizing society. So, that's a true economic way, people call it ideological, all kinds of things. They also have a set of values that they subscribe to. And human progress is all about values. Values shape human progress. But Nigerian parties, you can't tell what values they, they, they have or stand by. Well, this person is in this party, therefore this is the kind of values I know he lives by. Those don't exist. If we really then make the effort to build one, two, or three of such parties, the pressure for independence candidacy will be far less. Some have said that it would be in the best interests of the country to conduct the 2022 census before the elections. What impact do you think that the census would have on the elections? Uh, you know, because of this pre-Bendal culture, where government is about sharing, rather than about how do we make people produce so that their lives will be better. Uh, counting people has become a nightmare for Nigeria. Uh, because we know their census is lie, you know, because people want bigger numbers in their areas and stuff. I mean, I can tell you, a friend of mine went to work for the Bill Gates, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation years ago. They wanted to eliminate a certain um, ailment. And they pumped in a lot of resources into this particular part of Nigeria. And they, they were never consuming up to half of what was being pumped in there. And they got very upset with the people working in that area. Look, the idea is to eliminate this thing. You've been giving all these resources and you are not consuming the materials, whatever they were. And um, after a while, I said, look, we've given to every human being in sight. But the truth is that, <laughs> it's about the census, the numbers tell us about number of human beings there, it was more than twice what the number of people that live there. So they were, so no, this guy said, no, you guys are lying. There's something wrong with you. So they decided to use satellite imaging to count the people in that part of and they found that the people on the ground were right. They were really, as a friend of mine, very cynical, doesn't think there are more than 90 million people in Nigeria. <laughs> you know, but. But clearly it's important. Now let's talk about third force. Endlessly, Nigerians have been waiting for that big announcement on, 
on who will constitute the third force. You, in one of your engagements, did say that that announcement will come soon on who, who and who will be part of that coalition. But then again, how soon will that be, Prof? Um, well, first of all, let me say that I, I don't like the, the name or image of third force. Okay. Because it's not a third force. First of all, <laughs> PDP, APC, one party. But it gets me into well, first force, second force, that one party. You wake up in the morning, they don't share enough to you in APC, you move to PDP. If they, you disagree with them, before noon, you move back to APC. And before a week is out, you can go back and forth <laughs> six times. <laughs> so please don't tell me that there are two parties, there are one party. Okay. What Nigerians need is an alternative platform. A real people's party that incorporates the people, fight for the people, believe in the well-being of the people and the advance of the common good of all against these ones. The train carrying the big tent has already left the station. It's done. It's just that people have to keep entering at the various stations. Um, in the last couple of weeks, a variety of meetings, starting from one on my birthday on the 6th of February in Lagos, brought together many of these leaders. Let's bear in mind that we're trying to achieve a fusion of civil society, social movements, some political parties. And the definition of what we're trying to achieve is to create a coalition of the willing and the dispossessed. The willing being the philosopher kings, the thinkers, the dreamers who see a better Nigeria for the good of all. And the dispossessed, we've talked about women. Clearly, from what happened National Assembly, you will see that this political class has total contempt for women. You will see that they have contempt for young people. They've been called lazy, they've been called all kinds of things. You and I know that these young people are not as lazy as the people who have called them lazy. Huh? We have evidence that they are more hardworking than the people who call them lazy. Um, if you check where foreign direct investment is coming to Nigeria from today, it's majorly in the tech space. Young kids, given no chance, no opportunity by their country, are bringing in some of them seven million, some $200 million. And the estimate is this year, between four and five billion US dollars will enter to support those kids that have been called lazy. A fortunate thing for us is that as many of them get that money, they are being told, look, you are better operating out of New York than Lagos. So sometimes they move to New York, but it doesn't matter. Just that a lot of what could have continued to flow to Nigeria will be earned by people abroad, but a lot will come to Nigeria. But Nigeria originating companies, a global, we live in a global system, so where you, where you live probably doesn't matter too much. Um, if you go to Nollywood, you look at the young entertainers who have captured, I mean, I was in San Juan, Puerto Rico a few weeks ago, and the radio station was banging away, banging away. I thought for a second I was in Lagos. Radio station in San Juan, Puerto Rico, was playing Nigerian music nonstop. I thought, oh my goodness. These are the lazy young people. This is what they have done. So, we bring a coalition of the women, these young people, the intellectuals. You know, one of the major reasons Nigeria is sunk is because this political class has an anti-intellectual culture. If you look at China's ascendancy, Go and read the speeches made in 1978 by Deng Xiaoping, the savior of China. China went to sleep for 400 and something years until Deng. And the crux and the emphasis of Deng's leadership of China was we must recognize intellect and intellectuals in the place of our country's forward movement. When Deng became leader of China, I had graduated. And China's GDP output per person was about half of Nigeria's. Today is more than 30 times. If we bring together a coalition of these people, labor, which has been a bulwark in the conversations we've been having, 
women, youth, intellectuals, the professionals. And as this train is moving, they're all joining. Um, I can assure you that creating the new Nigeria has happened already. Well, but then again, are you not concerned about timing? I mean, it's, it's less than a year to the elections. So, you have the APC, the PDP, the big parties have already started their ground. What, what, what's their base? What's their base? They make noise. They steal public money and use it to try and buy votes. How many votes? I'll give you an example. One of the most tightly controlled states in our country, where this is the ultimate political machine, the state I live in, Lagos. The machine state. How many people voted for the governor that is there now? Less than 500 million people. 500,000 people. 500,000 people in a state that says that 25 million people live in it. You know what? If I get together all the polytechnic students and the university students in Lagos, I will vote out the governor. It will take one week's campaign for that to happen. One week! Because they have harmed the students so much, these guys, you get the students, wake up now and vote your future. You don't need to give them any money. So the billions that are stockpiling in the houses in Abuja will be a joke. I'm a professor of strategy. Some of the small companies that are beating giants use their weight against them. It's just like David and Goliath. Some people say, hey, look at you, this small boy. See this huge giant. And maybe they see it differently. This man is so big, I can't miss the target. I can't report. That's what's going to happen in Nigeria next year. Uh, are, we, are we expecting you to declare as well? <laughs> if they say that I can do a job there, and I do my duty, but my motive is not declaring and anything. You don't want to run for president anymore? I can run for anything. So would you be running? I don't know. People have to say to me they need me to run. If they say so, I will do my duty. How about the governorship? You, you always wanted to be a governor as well. I never wanted to be anything. Go and read you, my book. When you ran for governor? I ran for governor because people were disturbing me. They came in delegations to my house. Come and save our state. I said, please leave me alone. I don't, I'm not interested. They harassed me enough. I said to myself, well, duty. If I don't do it, suppose this is how God will judge me. I said, okay. And my friends refused to allow the primaries to take place. My friends, you know, they collected money from me. People without character collected serious money from me and didn't allow an election to take place. They had a meeting. Their governor said they should refund the money of these people. This is stealing. Till today, they've not refunded one cobble. These are the people Nigerians are voting for. Character is everything. Just before we go, Prof, ahead of the 2023 elections, so what changes do you hope to see for us to have a, an improved system, an improved election? Well, I hope that uh, the conscience of people get touched to realize that this is not about this moment. It's not about this person or that person. It's about our children and their children. Look, they're all making their choices already. Our children are all living. I mean, every day, the ones who have not left, most of them, because they can't leave. How can we build a country from which our children are running? When people sit back and let God walk through them to realize what is going on, perhaps we will have a new consciousness in going to 2023. It shouldn't be about this guy or that guy. It should be about the future. And you know what? History is very, very, very shrewd in his judgment. We will go before the judgment of our conscience. We will go before the judgment of history. We will go before the judgment of God. Let those who think that they are getting away with murder today think again. Professor Pato told me, thank you very much for coming to speak with us on Political Friday. Great pleasure to join you. Thank you. Well, that's Political Paradigm. Thanks for your time. I am Terry Ikumi. Goodbye. Thank you.